Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, this is Jack Miller with T360 and my partner Stefan Swanpole. And today we are just delighted to have uh, the two leaders from the uh, Asian American Association of Realtors here to talk to us a little bit about their uh, membership and some of the challenges that they have uh, noticed and observed. They've produced a great report about uh, the demographics and some of the unique differences in the Asian and Pacific Island population in the United States and real estate. And we'd love to share some of that with you today. So I'll quickly introduce them. We have Hope Atwell, who has been the executive director of the Asian Real Estate Association uh, since 2012. And we're just delighted to have you, Hope. And for this year, we have Jim Wong, who is the association president uh, for uh, 2020. And again, delighted to have you as well. And we look forward to having a, a really robust uh, conversation about um, the unique uh, differences and needs and perspectives of the demographic that you represent and your membership. So uh, just delighted to have you and uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Stefan. Good. Jack just forgot to introduce me today. You know, you know, he just forgets <laughs> that I'm even here. Yeah, I, I said I have my partner Stefan is here. So. Meanwhile, you know, we're talking about the Asian Real Estate Association of America. I'm probably the closer, closest to Asia today because I'm in the Pacific Islands at the moment. I'm in Hawaii. So you guys are further away from China and Asia than I am. So I'm closest. <laughs> so let's kick off with one of the things that I wanted to mention, which, uh, which came up in one of our earlier discussions. Uh, Jack and I was reading that wonderful report, State of Asia America, that we found on your website, which you pointed us to. And there were many things that were awesome, and I know Jack's going to refer to them, but the one that really, really stood out for me was you had a, you had a one-pager which had bubbles of different population groups, and, and Jack, what was it, 51 or so? 51, yeah, 51 different languages, and just this, this is a, a really impressive yeah, yeah, that one, chart. That one. No. Yeah, that, that just shows the, um, within the demographic, which is the Asian, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, uh, you have a tremendous number of subgroups and uh, a lot of different variation. Uh, really fascinating uh, to see it very different from uh, any of the other associations we've talked to. And, and, and I, I lived in Hong Kong for, for five, six years. So probably a little bit more aware than the average traditional just white American that maybe has not had the privilege of traveling to, to, the, to Asia. But I was still blown away by the, the complexity of what people generally just refer to as, as the Asian constituents. Hope, you must have a very complex task. Yeah, it is, it is. Um, you know, the, the, the Asian American population, the community itself um, is very diverse, right? We're not a monolithic type of community. And then you weave in the Pacific Islander community, mm -hmm. which is again, very, very different. Um, and Jim knows this, um, just within our executive board, there's Jim, we're, we're about maybe at least six different ethnicities within our executive board, right? Yes. So even managing the board is very, um, I would say very challenging. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it makes for a very exciting executive board for us because of just the cultural differences. Um, and you're right. I mean, the challenge within our membership is, is um, is obviously something that um, makes my job and, and uh, the staff within ARIA um, very unique. Um, and if, you know, with, with those challenges, um, there's, there's language, of course, right? Because as Jim had alluded to earlier when we were talking before the show, there's, one, there's no one unifying language for us. Right, and like the, you take a look at the Latino Hispanic population and, and their community, at least for the most part, um, if you speak Spanish, there's commonality within the different ethnicities. For us, it's not. I mean, even no, no commonality. Are the, are the languages very different? Very, very different, right? The characters, even the characters. Uh, that um, are unique to Chinese characters, Korean characters, Japanese characters, right, is very different. You take a look at um, the Filipino, I want to say, um, alphabet. It's very different because it's, um, it's combined English and also Castilian Spanish. So it's very diverse. 
Um, and so it's not just taking a look at, let's say, hey, Chinese are, are represents um, Asian Americans, it's not. And so we exist as an organization to be able to educate and inform um, stakeholders of the real estate industry to make sure that um, folks understand how to work with the different subgroups. But there are a lot of subgroups. And I'll, I'll even add to that, yes. that we are actually some are new immigrants, right? From the Chinese that came mm -hmm. over in the mm -hmm. 1800s during the gold rush. There is different populations of the Asian segment coming in at different times. So a lot of times we have the difference of not American born to immigrant coming into mm -hmm. it and to be uh, naturalized in America. So there is so many more differences and issues and things that we work through. But when people do look at, at, at us, they do kind of see that one group. Like they Ooh. said, we're that big one monolith. But we Ooh. are, if you look deeper, you'll see a lot of different parts. Jack, there is just this enormous task that we all have a responsibility to try and do to help all of the, oh, the African-American, Hispanic, Asian, the immigrant. I mean, this, this country, America is a wonderful country and I'm an immigrant as well but it is really a complex society, right? There are so many pieces to it. There are some threads that I think have, I was interested when I read the report, there were some threads in common with some of the other uh, associations we've talked to, but some differences too. And I think one of the things that struck me when I was reading through the challenges that um, you, know, you guys had highlighted for some of the de demographics was access to credit and the ability to, to, to get credit. Can you, I mean, I think, this was eye-opening for me, so I'd love our, our listeners to hear a little bit about it. Can you talk a little bit about that in, in the context of real estate? Jim, you want to uh, take a stab at that? or I'll, I'll take a start. Okay. So one of the things that we were looking at, because a lot of Asia, uh, AAPIs, the Asian Americans, or just Asians, we like to pay things off. We don't like to use credit. So we try to pay all cash. Uh, when we purchase things like our cars and even the house, we try to put larger down payments so we feel we're putting more money down rather than borrowing more money. But the, with the problem with that is we have thin credit files. We don't have big credit history because we don't like to borrow. We're not building up credit. So then mm -hmm. it's very hard to score us. So a lot of times the traditional model with FICO, it's hard to understand the the Asian American uh, uh, structure of financial structure because we don't build it because we rather save our money paid in cash. And that's what they kind of brought over culturally. And now that we could, if we could change when you pay your cell phone and other bills to show good uh, payment history, that would open up, we said maybe 300 more APIs within the US that could go and get more credit to be first time home buyers. Hope, I know you have a lot more to add on this. Go ahead, Hope. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, so just to add to what Jim had said, culturally, right, and I think there's some similarities, um, Jack, that you've pointed out to the Latino community mm. in that um, we are, as a community, we are debt averse, right? We're credit yeah. averse. So um, there's also an element, especially for new immigrants here in this country, there's also an element of distrust um, to financial institutions, particularly for those who have just come from Asia, right? Because banks have failed in, in some parts of Asia. And so they would rather, you know, keep their money, right? And uh, um, underneath their mattress or wherever they want to keep it. And, and so that's a problem with either um, not being able to um, really establish a good credit score. As, as Jim had said, it's not bad credit, right? It's thin credit. Um, and, you know, uh, to this day, my parents, um, you know, they're, they're, my, my father is 82, my mother is 79 years old. They will refuse to get a credit card. And when airlines, and I can't remember when airlines um, uh, transitioned into being cashless, right? My father would want a, a glass of wine and the flight attendant would not take yeah. his money. And he's like, I can't even drink wine. And I said, well, because it's cashless. And the idea of like, well, I'm, I have money, you know, but he's like, I'm, I'm refusing to get a credit card. And that's the mindset of a lot of older, uh, you know, kind of like first generation immigrants here to this day, right? It's, it's no, we have money, so we're going to spend what we have. And it works against them because, um, you know, they're not here in America, right? You're, you're deemed 
credit worthy when you have a good credit score. So for for people's mind, for a lot of immigrants' mindset, it's like it's countercultural. Why are you telling yeah. me that I am? I am credit worthy if I am building credit. It doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah. Shouldn't I be debt free so that you could actually loan me money? Um, so there's a lot of education. And as Jim had said, you know, if we can take a look at other scoring models beyond the traditional FICO, right? Um, and take a look at people's propensity to pay whether it's cell phone bills, right? Whether it's rent, whether it's medical bills, um, as opposed to credit card, I think that that it would open up a lot more um, mortgage-ready Asian American families here in the United States. I can so relate to that. So relate to that. <laughs> as an immigrant, when I came to America, the first thing I wanted to buy, I was going to buy cash, and the store said to me, "Would you like to open an account?" And I said, right? "No." And they said, would you like to open it? And my wife said, we've got to start the process. And I said, well, okay. And it was at Sears. It was a $20 lamp. I mean, it was, it was nothing. I had $1,000 in my pocket, right? And I said, okay, let's go through the process. It was a half an hour. It was painful. I, and then I got turned down. And they did not want to give me a credit line for $20. And they came back and said, sir, your credit score is zero. We right? Yeah. And it's like, I have my own company. Right, I've been in business for 20 years. What do you mean it's zero? Can't be zero, right? And 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 even up to today, I carry no no debt at all. Even even as a as a white person, right? But as an immigrant, I would rather also be debt free. It's just the way we think. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So and even cars, uh, we see that. And culturally, you know, I think um, Jim, you probably have experiences with this. Um, where, uh, where certain communities will pull together a um, large amount of cash so that one family could purchase a car in cash and then it's your term in two years, you know, it's your turn in two years or whatever. But then again, you know, we know that uh, credit for auto actually helps your credit score, right? Because it's a monthly payment, it's, a, it's substantial, two, three, four hundred dollars or what have you. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's a fascinating thing to actually take a look at, uh, but it's a very cultural thing. And hope Is that green? That, yeah, go ahead, Jim. Sure. Yeah, I think going on that, it's like my family, my wife's family had that experience where because they're not putting in the bank because of sometimes distrust, they have cash. They said, well, I'm not getting interest anyway. Why should you pay interest? Let's lend each other the money interest free. Mm -hmm. And you pay it back from your cash flow or where you make cash business running your own because Asians run a lot of their own small businesses. They get cash. They're just passing it around to each other rather than borrowing money because they're not making money off of that anyway. And it's like Hope said, it's a lot of education and teaching and, people how to And to some American, American thinking that might actually look questionable, right? right. Because right. it looks a little bit like, uh, what are you doing there? Yeah. Well, and I also I also noticed in the report there's some differences in I mean there's some unique challenges because uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of your population is in areas that are you know very uh, expensive to live in there's a lot of you know a lot of Asian Americans are in the West Coast and some of the markets that have really exploded in terms of of uh, the prices of homes in those markets so it's like a it's a double challenge yes. uh, in that you need even more credit in those situations. Um, so talk to us a little about the kind of what the what you see. And the other piece of that too is multi generational housing. So it felt like there were kind of two two pieces there as far as the places where there are a lot of Asian Americans and also their desire to have housing that supports multi generational living. And so talk yeah. to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so we, and, and as you've pointed out, right, you take a look at the map for where the, high, the, the, the uh, density of Asian Americans live, right? And so you're so right, we typically are in high price markets. Um, we, uh, as an entry point, we typically will first live in gateway cities. So you'll see us in LA, you'll see us in San Francisco, in Seattle, um, San Diego, there's spillover in San Diego because of the military bases. There's history about that, right? Filipino Americans, um, you'll see us in New York, you'll see us in Boston. 
So we tend to gravitate to those gateway cities that unfortunately are high price markets for, you know, just here in America, which is problematic because then, um, then the, per the, the, the whole perception that we have to come up with 20% down payment delays um, the, the whole homeownership process for a lot of Asian Americans. Um, but you'll see the migration trend, right? The migration trend right now is towards the South. Um, and if you take a look at a city like Houston in the last 15 years, how that has transformed into a huge Asian community, right? There's, um, in fact, one of our past chairs, his name is Kenneth Lee. He was instrumental in building the Chinatown in Houston. Uh, but if you take a look at uh, the Vietnamese population, the Filipino uh, American population, the Chinese population, right? They're, they're moving to cities like this because of the affordability, access to great school districts, um, and much more um, small business friendly type of states where mm. taxes, right? Taxes are uh, much more palatable. Mm. Um, they, you know, both Jim and I are here in California uh, and, you know, we pay sunshine taxes, right? And, and for small businesses, it's very, um, I want to say it, it's increasingly becoming much more unaffordable. Um, and so there's this exodus from, from California to cities like Houston, to cities like Atlanta, cities like Charlotte, believe it or not, right? You, you wouldn't think that those are cities that Asian Americans would flock to, but they're known for their, um, again, affordability, access to great schools, and um, you know, more, much more business friendly. Jim, um, what are your thoughts? So, and also, you know, when the more expensive cities, like Hope said, they come to the gateway because there's a, a base that they feel comfortable. We even said in Koreatown, you know, what's probably reported versus what's not reported. You could probably speak Korean in Los Angeles and you don't have to go anywhere. You could just be Korean, you're okay. Uh, but so, so that is always a way where they feel safe. They come to a community, they could do business, they get their footing, they understand, they talk to people. And, and also uh, with the Asian Americans, they actually co-sign for each other more than any other group. So they help each other mm -hmm. get the housing, work together as a team, may all live in a house and then they kind of move together. But once they're here, they, they go, well, you know, now other pockets are opening up and you see communities in Houston, Dallas, you know, in uh, Tennessee, in North Carolina. It's just moving around where now they understand through coming into America, understanding, and now finding a des another desirable place to live and growing new uh, pockets of Asian communities. So now a lot of times you don't see a Chinatown, a Koreatown, you see an Asian town. They all kind of group together, like in Dallas. Uh, I was, I was uh, really surprised to see it to where it was, you know, Indian food, Chinese food, a Korean bar, you know, a Ranch 99. Uh, so all these businesses are all, all working together now, which is kind of the changes where you used to see different Asian groups just being their own town, now kind of aggregating together and a lot of collaboration, cooperation, but understanding what America looks like, they're starting now to figure it out and move around. So I found that very interesting from the, uh, from the data from the state of Asia, America. Mm. Does the broad Asian community see real estate as a career? Do they, do they like to potentially, do they consider become a real estate professional as something to do or not really? Oh, awesome. So they all want us to be doctors, lawyers, or engineers. engineers. <laughs> In the profession. Yeah. You know, but, but the great thing is being in America longer, they're starting to see, ah, there's other ways you can make money. And it's really, they just want their kids to be stable. You know, when they don't know something, they don't know if it's stable. But, but uh, it, it's changing, right, Hope? <laughs> it is, it is. And, and um, that's a really great question, right? Because, um, in fact, we did an interview with uh, one of our top producers, Jamie Tian, um, from, she serves, Jim, she serves the Beverly Hills market, very Beverly young. Market. Yes. Um, you know, she attended UCLA. And that was exactly as Jim had said, her parents expected for her to either become a lawyer or a doctor. 
And I know that there's a lot of jokes about that, but to some degree, it's actually true, right? They want us to be in professions where there's perceived stability. They want us to be engineers, right? Uh, they want us to be in healthcare and all of that stuff because there's stability and there's also, um, I want to say, Jim, there's there's a certain kind of like expectations because prestige. of the yeah, like a prestige. families, yes. right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because then they can say back home, hey, my, you know, my children are this, this that. Yeah. Um, so to your question, real estate is not something I think that firsthand people think about, um, at least from the older generation, right? It's like, what are you going to go into real estate and what's going to happen to you, right? Yeah, because yeah, okay. the question, again, is that it's not a stable career. But I think a lot of people are now looking at it as one, it's not just the, the, um, the, the I want to say, um, the opportunity to uh, make a boatload of money, but it's it's a way to help our community um, as far as kind of like generational wealth right and so people are looking and and real estate is big for asian um asian families and asian communities it's great that our numbers keep on um i want to say increasing right our um depending on which report you take a look at our home ownership rate is, will hover anywhere between 54 to 56 percent right and 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 that's great is because it truly is a big push for um for i want to say older generation right jim that one of the things that you do right after graduation is you got to start thinking about you know putting um to thinking about buying a house right and and you can't even think about getting married unless you have a home unless you actually have um, have purchased a home. And so um, I think people now are understanding that because of those values, right, that are important for us, having a career in real estate is actually helping promote those values. And one other thing is that we're all finding out that by buying a home, that is the single wealthiest, single biggest purchase and it's for savings. So when you do get older and you paid, you, your house is paid off. So there's so much benefits. And I think this works for all different ethnic groups is we're learning the earlier start. It's a forced payment of somewhere you want to live. But at, over time, it is a largest creation of wealth. And, and it's a great way for everyone to build that security is by buying a home and keeping the payments. Is there a lot of a growth opportunity here for us? to potentially try and increase the home ownership amongst Asian Americans, try and get that. What is the percentage at, at the moment? Uh, right now it's about 56%, uh, Stefan, as, as far as our home ownership rate is concerned. Um, one of the, and, and you ask about an opportunity and in the report, I have a copy right here, you'll see um, right after that page, um, Jack, uh, the bubbles, right, uh, about our community is the API mortgage ready potential. And this is a great map. It's sort of like a heat map, right, that shows where are the, what, 4.1 million Asian Americans who are deemed to be credit worthy. And I know that um, Freddie Mac, um, has obviously a, a, a disclaimer about this in that, um, you know, this this particular data is pre-COVID, right? And so we, we probably will see some modifications and adjustments to these numbers come next year. Um, but the the, the, there's tremendous opportunity, Stefan, um, in, in that particularly in the South, where our community members are moving to the Midwest is a great opportunity. Um, Chicago alone is, is home to a good number of Asian Americans, right? The city of Chicago um, and some of the suburbs, again, because of the school district. Um, but to answer your question, tremendous, tremendous opportunity. Um, one thing though that, you know, we talked about education is really educating our community that they don't have to wait to come up with a 20% down payment, particularly in high-priced markets. Um, 
And there's nothing wrong with using FHA loans, right? And, and there's a lot of education about that too, because if you take a look at um, like the, uh, our, our consumption as far as the conventional loan is concerned, we, um, we generate a lot of conventional loans, right? Right behind the uh, non-Hispanic whites. And because again, the perception is, you know, we don't want FHA, um, that means government help and, you know, our, our community and is very prideful, they're shame associated if you're, um, you know, using government help and government assistance, right, Jim? Um, it, and so there's a lot of education and there's a lot of opportunity there. Do you know? the different Asian constituents from the different countries, are there some countries that feel stronger about home ownership? So maybe is, is Filipino stronger or, or Taiwan or Korea or China? Or is there a, a general excitement towards the American dream? Uh, I'll go ahead. The American dream is always very exciting. And home ownership, because in their country, sometimes you can't own a home or they yeah. never had an opportunity to own a home because there is no finance. You just had to buy it all cash. And yeah. you live with the family for very, very long. So uh, the American dream is really what makes so many... Uh, a, a, a Asian Americans, Asians come to this country for that. I can now buy a home. I can start a business. I can get an education. You know, these are these basic fundamentals that just gives you thinking that there's these opportunities that you don't have in your own country. So that drives tremendous amount of Asians to come to America for that dream. And really one of the big ones is the home ownership part. Isn't that, isn't that a great benefit that this country just offers, which, yes. which applies not only to the Asian population, but, but the Latino or the African-American or, or others that we, that we all, not we all, but so many of us want to immigrate to one place because we feel that we can live a, a better life for our kids and our family and our parents. And, oh, it's exciting. I'm going to, I'm going to super apologize. I did give you guys a heads up. I apologize. We have a, a very large client that has, has a meeting on uh, today at the same time. They've actually been on already a half an hour and they had uh, <laughs> thought that they could arrange it and get it uh, at the same time. And unfortunately I said to them that you guys are more important. I've been talking to you, but I did promise them I would join them for the last few minutes of their call. So I'm going to hop off, but you're in great hands with Jack. Jack, thank you very much for continuing the discussion with these two delightful people. And I will talk to both of you very soon. No, thank you right. very much. Thanks, thank John. I appreciate right. the handoff. So okay. have a great call. Um, right. Thank you. So I, I had some follow up just from the report that I wanted to have some conversation about because there's such great material in here. Um, and I, I think that, you know, looking at the opportunities to grow and develop home, home ownership in uh, the Asian American population, what are, what are some of the initiatives that are important for us to be paying attention to? Are, and are there any specific things that your association is working on or that um, that we should make sure people are aware of or, or, or that they can get mobilized by? Um, what, 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 what's happening there to support that? So, so Jack, we always do every year uh, policy day, our three point plan. You know, one this year it's GSE reform, it's alternative credit and language access. We've been pushing and pushing these items, mostly language access and also uh, alternative credit because this is what really affects our community. And what we're trying to do is really a lot of education. But I know Hope has been working on this fight for a long time. So Hope, uh, anything more on this? Yeah, yeah, and, and that's so true, right? Language access, alternative credit, which we spoke um, and, and spend a little bit of time. And let me just go back to language access because it's something that, um, is very important for a community um, from a home ownership, you know, making sure that there's language access. Um, it's, it's fairly difficult for people to understand the complexities of buying a home, right? And, and the mortgage transaction. Um, Jack, not sure where, which market you are, but um, I know when I bought my home here in California, you know, your disclosures are, it's it's a book. It's 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 a, a lot huge, of documentation. Right? In California. It's, it's, yeah. Oh my goodness! It's like, do they really want me to buy a house? Yeah. I mean, I have to I have to read all. Can you imagine for us who is uh, proficient in English, it's hard enough for us to understand all of that stuff. For sure. Think yeah. about someone who does not understand what loan to value means. 
right? What APR means, what an arm means and all of that stuff. It's yeah. very, very overwhelming. And that's why we can't stress the importance of language is because if they can understand what they're signing, what they're, you know, how, how do you even explain a good you know, good faith estimate, right? And all of that stuff, because you can't really just use Google translation or just do no. translation because it's going to be out of context. And so it's a terrific opportunity that we've had with uh, FHFA um, in the last four years, uh, four or three years that we've um, been partnering with them in um, translating kind of like this this glossary of hundreds and hundreds of terms that is related to the mortgage process. So they recently, uh, last year, they rolled out Chinese. Um, mm -hmm. They're going to be rolling out Vietnamese this year. Um, Tagalog, which is Filipino, is, is next, and then Korean. Um, and that matches kind of like the largest subgroups of Asians based on the U.S. Census. Um, but language access is one of the initiatives that we have been, I want to say, been advocating for as an organization um, for many, many years. I, th I think, in, in fact, as uh, you know, when, when ARIA was formed, that was something that uh, Jim Park, Alan Okamoto, and, and John had started kind of like talking about. The other thing that I think would be uh, beneficial for, for the community is at the very early days of ARIA, John Wong had developed, one of our founders um, uh, developed a course, it's actually CE approved um, in the state of California called Effectively Serving the Asian American Market. And it's, it, it's, a, it's an initiative that explains the different subgroups, ethnicity mm. within the Asian population, right? How do you work with, let's say you have a large Japanese American um, community within your, you know, lo your local market. Then how do you work with Japanese Americans? Because it's very different uh, working with Korean Americans, right? Or working with Chinese Americans. Um, and why family is important, why, right? Why education is important and all of that stuff. I want to say that's probably a great initiative for um, uh, real estate professionals to be familiarized if they're interested um, at all in serving this community. Um, and, you know, they can reach out to Jim or I and, and we can, you know, provide some, some um, either, you know, Zoom training or webinar training or however, you know, whatever platform uh, they would be comfortable in. I, I just messaged Chris Riley, who's on, who, who kind of managed these calls. He, he, he's looking it up right now, see if we can find those resources. So, but yeah, we definitely love to get those resources out there. And I've, I've done work because I came out of the technology industry. I've done a lot of work with people in overseas markets that are in, develop, really, you know, software developers and things like that. And there is a big, there's a lot of cultural differences that you uncover when, um, you know, especially cultures that have like, they have some shame in them. They don't want to tell you that things are going wrong or, you know, those kind of things. You have to approach things differently. And um, negotiation is very different too. I think yes. it's, it's very different how um, how uh, different Asian cultures and Middle Eastern cultures also tend to negotiate. And it's um, it, it you know it, it's just something you need if you're going to work with that population. Uh, it's important to to know that because otherwise you're you know you're going to be surprised by your first transaction and not understand what's happening. So. Um, in fact, that's why we we always encourage people and they love to join Aria because you kind of get the the understanding, meaning the immigrants and the Asian Americans that were born here and then different nuances. So you do know how to interact. And we said, sometimes they don't even want to work with their own. Mm -hmm. So if you understand our culture, you actually will get the business. A non-Asian yeah. will get the business. So it is very interesting. And that's why Aria has been so successful and growing uh, because of the inclusion, the diversity that we have. And if you ever show up to any of the chapters, which I was fortunate pre-COVID to travel around, I looked at the audience and it was a mixture of everyone. There was so much collaboration. I, I could very rarely say that sometimes the AAPI, the Asian American Pacific Island, were the dominant in, in a group when we have our events. So that is something really interesting and fascinating, but very accepting of ARIA, of how you know, we really like to add everyone and make everyone feel welcome. That's, that's fantastic. Um, do you see any differences between 
Um, you know, they're, because the people that come from the Philippines, uh, you know, they're, I, I'm aware there are some distinct cultural differences. What are some of the distinct cultural differences that you can just say at a high level you'd want people to be aware of or, or know about? And, you know, anything that comes to mind that would help our, uh, help our listeners understand. Oh, <laughs> Jim, <laughs> some high level differences. Um, oh, well, okay. Don't assume we all speak the same language. We don't. Don't yeah. assume everyone's Chinese because that is the dominant one that's been around. Yeah. So they it's always think everyone's group. Chinese. They're not all Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 At least ask something more acceptable, you know, maybe where your origin, but be careful too, because many of us, we were born in America. So to us, it's always weird. And we understand what you're saying. And whether we want to be nice or not, sometimes we force you to say the question because they want to ask our ethnicity but a lot of us were born in America, but I keep on getting, where are you from? And I'm like, what do you mean where I'm from? I'm from here. I was yeah. born in New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, as far as differences, um, one of the things that I think, you know, um, would be high level difference is just income levels, right? right. Um, so if, if you take a look at different subgroups of Asian Americans, um, it's very complex. Again, we're not a monolithic type of like population. You take a look at the South Asians, right? Um, the Indians, and they skew us to really the, the top tier, right? Because they come to this country, they're highly, highly educated, at least, yep. a, at least a graduate degree. Right, their propensity to uh, make at least a hundred thousand dollars is higher than any subgroup within the Asian American population, and they're usually two high income earners. Um, same thing too, I think, with with Chinese Americans, right? And then you take a look at the other subgroups. You take a look at, let's say, Nepalese or um, Laotians, and um, you know, there's there's higher uh, poverty rate within those mm -hmm. communities even among Filipinos. So I want to say income disparity is um, something that is a challenge within our community. And while I love Crazy Rich Asian, the movie, you know, <laughs> it, it, it perpetuates the myth yeah. that all Asians are rich, right? We don't need any yeah. help. When in fact, as a matter of fact, you know, we do. In fact, again, behind the um, non-Hispanic whites, we are the largest consumer of conventional loans. And so that just shows you that, yes, we do need credit, right? We need a 30-year mortgage, preservation of the mortgage, 30-year mortgage, um, and all of that stuff. But yeah, I, I think um, income disparity is one of the, I want to say, one of the things that, um, that we see as, as um, a high level kind of like difference within our community. Yeah, and some of it depends on when, uh, when the family moved to the Americas because you have some very, like I've been to answer an earlier question that came up, I'm in Austin, Texas, okay. and we have, we have a, a, a very large uh, Thai and Vietnamese and mm -hmm. Indian population here. Um, and some, some of them are first generation uh, but there's a lot of second and third generation as well that have been here for quite some time. And that also has a big impact because they've had the wealth effect of if they've been here where they have more, they've had more income, they've bought real estate, um, they've established themselves. And so they, so I think that's, I think you have a couple of, one of them is the, the variable of an income disparity on the front end, but also how long their family's been here. And the longer they've been here, they tend to tend to accumulate wealth. And so you may be dealing with people that actually have done that. So I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's interesting to see it's a slice of the American experience where people have such a different, uh, it's so different depending on when they came over, where they came from, how long they've been here, which careers they went into, the educational background they started with. Um, so just tremendous uh, example of the diversity of, of this country uh, within just this segment. So I do have some questions that have been rolling in. We have some people that have been on, they've been asking some questions, so it's great. Um, uh, I've got an easy one for you guys, which is uh, from uh, Edwin uh, asked, uh, how do we join ARIA? How do we get involved? What's the, what are their criteria? Do you, do you just go to the website and sign up? What's, what's the process? How do we do it? So www.areaa.org, O-R-G, and you yeah. don't have to have any experience except you want to work and learn about the AAPI community. 
So, so there are 41 chapters, and, and as we said before, over 17,000 members in North America. So Canada is part of us too, with uh, Vancouver and Toronto, but we pretty much uh, cover most of the states where the API communities are thriving. So if you are interested, please look at our website. You will find a chapter nearby, or if, you, if there isn't one, please talk to Hope, and maybe we can help you form a chapter and it's really to open up and share our experiences, our culture, our language, the nuances, so you can get to understand us better. Hope, anything else? Yeah, no, that's it. Um, just aria, A-R-E-A-A dot org um, forward slash join. It'll give you a drop down on the 41 chapters that we have. If you're outside of the U.S. and Canada, um, then we do um, encourage you to consider joining um, ARIA Global, which is our international sort of like su subsidiary. But yeah, it's $99. Um, you know, you don't have to be Asian to join. Anybody can um, sign up. It's great. Uh, you are, um, you have an interest in really learning about the Asian American culture and supporting our core mission, which is to um, increase home ownership within the AAPI. That's great. Well, um, I want to switch gears for a second and ask you some questions about how your organization has, uh, and many other associations have the same thing, uh, how, how you guys have dealt with COVID and some of the changes and support for membership. Because, you know, we know associations, especially local chapters, you, know, you guys get together regularly. I know you guys have several conferences during the year. And, you know, what's, what, are you, what have you done to, to modify and, and how, how have you coped with that? Because it's, it's been a leadership challenge for everyone. So, so Jack, when we started, no COVID, <laughs> I was running around to all the chapters, right, installing the yeah. new president. And then I said, at March 13th, the last one was the uh, Jacksonville chapter in Florida. Mm. It ended. And then I stayed. And then all this news started popping out. No one started travel. And the great thing is with Hope and everyone, they saw what was kind of going on. And then we started adapting to using Zoom or Skype or Facebook and finding the right platform. From the top level up, uh, going down, we started teaching our chapters, our regionals, how to adapt, how to put content, and just use this new you know, technology and platform so we could reach our members, our sponsors, still adding value while being safe, right? Safe and responsible. So, so that was one of the big things. And I know Hope has been, always been working because she has these heavier tasks of the large events, right? The large national events like everyone else and really unwinding it and, and adjusting to it. But I, I, one of the things I just want to say with the AAPI, with the Asian Americans in our community, what they did that was so outstanding was to give back. What they did was help first responders, the local communities, the small businesses. Mm -hmm. How can they support? If you look on our website, if you look at individual chapters, they're bringing food to, to, to the hospitals. They're serving wherever they can. They're buying foods to support the local restaurants, uh, the local small businesses, doing whatever they can in the American fabric to help out. So right now, yes, we want to help sustainable home ownership, but we all want to be Americans and help America out and giving back to the first responders and our local communities. Yeah, and if I can just add to that, um, Jack, and you know, transition from um, in-person events to virtual platforms, right? Um, it wasn't such a big shift for our um, our association, our organization, our membership, because um, if you take a look at data regarding Asian Americans, we tend to over index when it comes to the use of technology, yes. right? Yeah. Um, and so we're, we're very proficient. I'm not, but our community is very proficient yeah. with the use of technology, the latest gadgets and all of that stuff. So it was, um, I want to say, you know, quite seamless. Um, to transition from an in-person to, as Jim had said, Skype or Zoom because of their comfort level um, in using technology. Now, obviously, our preference is, is to be in person, and we all can't wait with the rest of the world to be able to hug and, and shake people's hands and, and do in-person events. Um, but we've seen even that transition to be seamless within our chapters in, and even they are doing, you know, even um, virtual happy hours and, um, you know, uh, even uh, gym, even kind of like um, exercises and, and healthy type of like events where- Cooking you know, classes, comedy shows. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So, just making, been, having fun with it. And what, that's what we need. Exactly. Exactly. So it's, it's been a good transition um, and we're adapting well. Thank you for asking. We're adapting well, um, like the rest of the world. Um, and, you know, we'll, we will be in this state for as long as, um, I guess, you know. Until we can go out and it's safe. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're I think we're all wait, all waiting for that um, wherever we are. So, um, so I think this is a good a good closing segment. Let's give any any last thoughts, anything else that you'd want the uh, the you know the members of the real estate community that come to our fireside Fridays to to know about or any closing commentary. I, I think I've I've got a piece which is that I think there's a huge opportunity in serving this community and being involved. I've heard, you know, both from the report and from what you've talked about today, um, you know, what, what a great community that has very specific things that they've said, hey, your report's very clear. It says, hey, we need, you know, better, better ways to validate that we're credit worthy. You know, we, we need you some language support to help us understand all this, which real estate's super challenging process anyway. Uh, so it's very clear, I think, the, the, you know, what, the, what your organization has said, these would help uh, improve that. But what are, what are some things that you would leave this audience with and, and encourage them uh, to do or, or to learn about? Yeah, Jim, if, if, if I can just start, um, I do think I applaud you guys for focusing on diversity, right? Because if you take a look at where um, America stands right now, right, we're a very multicultural and diverse country. And so really understanding diverse cultures and how to serve this is, I think it's a must, right? It's not even an option at this point, because if you look around you, um, the fastest growing communities are, you know, not the um, Caucasian communities, but the multicultural communities. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think I encourage everybody who's listening and, and watching to um, just explore other communities if you're not familiar. And, um, you know, whether it's NAREB, whether it's NAREP or ARIA or even other uh, multicultural groups to just get to know us um, because that's part of just, you know, growth and, and education. And it's, and it's smart business. I mean, demographically, yeah. it's where we're going. It's smart business. And, you know, we, we're, we all need to learn how to play in the sandbox together and play well and get along, make money, support each other. It's good. Mm -hmm. So, Jim? That's great. And, yeah, and I'll end it. I agree 100% collaboration. I've been reaching out to all the other trade groups, not because I have to, because I want to. And how can we work together? So, so please join all the other trade groups, support us, get to know us, and wear your mask. Please, let's all protect each other wearing <laughs> the mask and help each other cut this down so we can soon see each other and start hugging each other, having a great uh, dinner together, having some drinks together. And, you know, it's just, that human contact like we knit, we miss so much. So please everyone, let's, let's all stay strong together, work together, and we will beat COVID together. So great, uh, everyone. We've had a great uh, 45 minutes with Aria and Hope and Jim to talk about um, you know, what, what we can do to come together as a, as a broader community and to support um, not, just, uh, not just the Asian American, but also other populations. Uh, in the United States with real estate, home ownership, and uh, increasing leadership and membership uh, from these populations. So if you've been joining us for these three calls so far, thank you so much. And then uh, Jim and Hope, I just want to say thank you for taking the time uh, and responding to us and being here. Um, if you haven't, if anybody on this call has not downloaded this fantastic report, State of Asia, America, it's fantastic. I printed it out and marked it up. Go get it. It's got great stuff in it and sign up. Uh, sign up for Aria. It sounds like uh, you guys have some great information for anybody that wants to learn more. So really appreciate you coming out today. And on behalf of Stefan and the rest of the T3 team, we want to say thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.